Welcome to Creative AI Conversations with me, Leah Coleman. In this interview series, we'll be chatting with prominent machine learning researchers and artists on their perspectives on Creative AI. Could you introduce yourself and what you do? Hi, I'm Rebecca Fiebrink. I am a reader at the Creative Computing Institute at University of the Arts London. And uh, a lot of my teaching and research is focused on uh, how machine learning can be used as a creative tool. Yeah, and um, could you give a quick rundown of your background? My undergraduate degrees are in computer science and music. Uh, I did that because when I was a teenager, I couldn't decide which one of those areas I really wanted to pursue. Luckily, I got involved in research as an undergraduate and realized that you could apply computer science to all sorts of really cool problems in music. So then I went and did a master's in music technology and I did a PhD in computer science. But even from the beginning of my PhD, I was really focused on how computational techniques could be useful to musicians. Um, and I ended up doing a PhD focused on how machine learning could be used by experimental composers. So ever since then, I've been exploring related topics in my research. Could you talk a bit more about like what is, yeah, what that intersection between like music and AI and technology looks like? The intersection between music and AI and technology is super exciting. I think it's become even more exciting in the last decade or so. Of course, you know, there's a centuries long history of people doing innovative technology work within music. Um, more recently, uh, one of the fields that I would call my home um, has focused on ways of creating new musical instruments using technology. So there's a whole research field of people, both um, musicians and creative practitioners and computer scientists and engineers trying to explore what kinds of instruments can we make? What kinds of instruments should we make? How can music performance practice itself be changed by the new types of technologies around us? Could you describe a bit more like what sort of like live interactions are possible? Because I think like in the past when I've worked with machine learning, it's been like, you know, inference takes a really long time. And like there's this whole latency thing, which makes it hard to do real time. I think it's actually a misconception that machine learning has to take a really long time and require a lot of computing power. What you can do with simpler uh, machine learning algorithms that are capable of running fast is you could train it. And then a second later, you have a running model um, and you can try it out. And if you don't like what it does, or if you want it to do something different, you can adjust the training data or adjust some other aspect of the model. And then a second later, maybe you have something new. There's all sorts of exciting research happening around taking some of the more cutting edge deep learning models and making them run in real time on mobile devices. So you can absolutely take advantage of that technology as well if you want to do real-time computer vision, for instance. In, in terms of like all the, the cool projects you've seen and like made, like what, what has been like one highlight? So it's really hard to choose one highlight of work that's it's like my favorite. Um, I've, I've made some software for real-time creative machine learning since about 2008, um, it's called Wekinator. It's been around for a while now. It's had something like 45,000 users. One of my favorite original examples, which I, sh I still show videos of this, you know, 10 years later, is one of the first pieces um, that somebody made with Wekinator. It was a musical instrument made out of a piece of tree bark. And what she did was she put a bunch of tiny light sensors in the bark, um, which are capable of sensing you know, where her hands are sort of casting shadows over the bark, or if she's standing on a stage, if she's leaning into the light or into the shadow, you can get all of these sorts of interactions picked up through these sensors. But of course, if you're using you know, an array of a couple dozen light sensors, that's a really unwieldy sort of input to work with as a programmer. Um, but she, the composer, by the way, her name is Michelle Nagai, um, and you can watch videos of her work online. Um, she just, she made this really beautiful sounding instrument um, out of this complicated system. And she was able to use machine learning to build something fairly easily because, you know, you're able to give it examples of where your hands are over the bark and match that with a sound and then put your hands somewhere else, match that with another sound and build up an instrument. Is that what the, the pipeline usually looks like for a training? 
Yeah, so if you wanted to build a new interaction with Weconator, it often looks like you say, okay, when I do this thing, I want the machine to do this. And when I do this other thing, I want the machine to do that. And you can give as many of those examples as you want. In practice, you only, you know, you only need to start with two different things and then you're gonna end up with an interactive system. Could you talk a bit more about Weconator and like the, I don't know, like the, the power set or like the features that are available within it? And like what sort of models are good for which sort of applications? So um, I made Weconator originally as a tool for musicians, but made a second version in about 2015, which is much more general purpose. It will listen for data coming in from the world, and that could be data from a camera or an Arduino, or it could be from, you know, Twitter, or it could be from like anything that you could imagine getting information from. Um, and then it'll take that and do supervised learning. So either classification or regression or um, dynamic time warping, which is, is a, a form of classification that looks at how things change over time. And it'll do those and then output some numbers, which again, get sent to kind of wherever you wanna send them. So you could send it to a music synthesizer and make different sounds when people do different things. And like, what are, like if Weconator is like somewhere in the middle, what are the, the other programs that people tend to use, like Touch Designer or other, other things like? People use all sorts of things connected to Weconator. It could be, um, you know, Max MSP, Open Frameworks, Processing, P5.js, uh, people have done stuff with Rhino, um, Isadora. I guess shifting gears a little bit, what are you working on right now and what are you excited about? So I've got a bunch of projects on right now um, with a lot of collaborators and postdocs and PhD students. Um, I've got a, a project right now that's wrapping up soon um, called InteractML, which is in collaboration with some VR researchers and game design researchers. We've made a, an interactive machine learning tool for Unity and Unreal, where if you're a game developer or you're maybe doing really weird interactive artwork in VR, you can make new kinds of gestural controllers, you can make new types of reactive systems. And I've done a bit of research with my students thinking about, all right, what is what does the curriculum need to look like for creative machine learning? Because it's I think it's very different from the curriculum for computer science machine learning. Yeah, I, I teach artists like about AI and how to like, like, I don't know, run things in Google Colab. Like what have you found or like the things that you leave out or the things that you mentioned like are not that helpful to like explain um, when you're teaching? So the obvious example is that, you know, if you're going to be using machine learning in a set of off the shelf tools, whether that's code libraries or GUI programs like Weconator or InteractML, you don't need a lot of the mathematical theory. And no amount of theoretical knowledge is going to keep you from having to try out a bunch of different things and just see what happens. An even more important difference when we think about how to teach machine learning to creatives and what, what kind of tools we should build for creatives is that you know, if you take a machine learning course in computer science, you're gonna learn to think about data in a particular way. You're gonna learn to think about data as ground truth. So your data set is sort of this, this sacred thing that implicitly embodies some phenomenon in the world that you don't understand and nobody understands. And the data set is your way into understanding this. But in creative domains, I think it's really helpful to think about data as a communication interface, as something that you know, is integral to the debugging process in machine learning and also needs to be something that, you know, is foregrounded in any kind of creative tool. And, and you know, if you're using CoLab or other sort of code-based environments, you really need to build up your skill set for that data visualization, data cleaning, all the, the sort of data work in a, you know, that's that's just so important. If you think about so many things that creators care about, it's, you know, how does something look? How does something feel, right? If we can communicate those things using examples, that's how we communicate with each other if we can, if we're trying to talk about how something looks or feels or, or how somebody moves. So examples are a really, you know, natural way of communicating when we're talking about embodied practices um, or creative practices. Like you mentioned that you studied both music and computer science and 
can you talk more about like I don't know from a personal viewpoint how like how that came about and how yeah how like being you know sitting in one field and another has been for you I'm motivated at the end of the day by by making computational tools that can enrich people's creative practices so sometimes that means enabling professional creators to do something that they could never do before, that nobody could ever do before. Sometimes it means enabling children or novices to, to do something for the first time. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it's about supporting human creative engagement because that is such an important part of life, no matter who you are. I've, I've always been interested in technology and I've always been interested in music and other types of creative expression. And so, you know, when I started really learning how to program as a teenager, I was, I always saw it as uh, a, med a means of creative expression. So I was making websites back in the day before you, you know, could use tools. You had to know HTML to build websites. I was building fan fiction websites with my friends. I started building um, animation programs on my graphing calculator in math class when I didn't want to pay attention in math class. Like for me, coding has always been something that you do to, to be creative. And yeah, I guess like shifting gears a bit to research, what, what do you, what was the last paper you read and what are you investigating currently? The last papers I've read um, are from the, the most recent NIME conference. Um, so NIME stands for New Interfaces for Musical Expression. And it's a conference that's been around for about 20 years now about people trying to make new technologies for music performance. And there's some really nice um, critical reflection papers in the conference right now. There was a nice paper about um, sustainability and how we approach that as a research community. And then there was another one about how we, how we collect and communicate our, our shared history and thinking about the fact that, you know, this isn't something we can take for granted, that this isn't something that is necessarily being done well right now, but, you know, as a, an interdisciplinary community of people who say that we value artistic approaches and we value scientific approaches and we value diverse voices, like how are we actually um, putting that into practice and, and how do we know and what's the record of this and how do we get better at actually, you know, supporting our efforts to become reflective. You know, I've been reading with a lot of interest around, um, you know, research methodologies that, um, you know, involve what we would historically call users or participants in more equitable ways. How do you make technology for and with other people who aren't you? If we only have technology makers coming from narrow slices of society in certain countries and certain socioeconomic groups, there are questions that are, they're never going to consider. There are applications they're never going to consider. So I think the, you know, both diversifying the set of technology creators and academic researchers and just, you know, trying to better educate everybody in that field to think more maturely about ethics and equity and fairness and participation. I guess like you touched on this a little bit already, but like what are the things that each group can like learn from each other and how they can benefit from like, yeah, being like, oh, you are from this different field. Like, where is the the room for mutual, um, like mutual benefit? One of the most important things that technologists, you know, can do, um, if they want to be working with artists or learning from artists, is to to get used to challenging themselves to to really understand, you know what people's goals are when they use technology. Um, and I think it's it, artists, creators of, of from any domain are going to come to technology usually and see it as, okay, this is a, this is a tool. Um, machine learning is a little bit special because sometimes it can be a branding exercise and that's sort of, you know, not the territory I'm interested in, but if, if somebody is really, you know, they don't care about the branding, they want to do something meaningful in their own practice, um, you know, they're going to articulate that in particular ways that may not be completely clear, you know, how that lines up with the technology. Yeah, I think, I think at this moment and, and for the last 
you know, six or seven years, um, there, there has been a lot of hype around machine learning. And, you know, it's really cynically been a good way for people to, you know, make a pile of money here and there with art that isn't necessarily that exciting conceptually or technically, but it's sort of, you know, you can, it ticks the box, you can market it, you know, if you, if you shout loudly enough that you're, you're making art with machine learning, somebody might offer you a big pile of money. I think, you know, a lot of attention goes to people who can claim that, oh, it's an artificial agent or it's, a, it's an artificial intelligence in the program. It makes a good story. Sometimes it gets people's attention, but, you know, I think that's just such a small part of what machine learning and AI can really do practically for people. Do you have any advice for, I guess, on the two sides, like a technologist who wants to use Weckinator for something creative or like, you know, like a creator, like a musician who has like zero experience, like how would, how would they each respectively get started? Yeah, so I think um, technologists who are interested in doing creative work, honestly, you know, start doing creative work. Uh, and I think, you know, there's lots of, there's lots of fantastic work out there already that can inspire people. I think, you know, uh, NeurIPS, for instance, has had a workshop on machine learning for art and design for like four or five years now. And, you know, art is a practice and you have to make things over and over and over to get good at it. And you have to become aware of the creative landscape in order to position your work within that, if that's what you wanna do, if you actually wanna make something that's sort of recognized by others as art. And then I think for, for artists interested in getting into machine learning, there, you know, there are an increasing number of courses online that people can take. Um, if people want to use supervised learning and uh, Weckinator or similar tools, um, I've got a, a MOOC from 20, 2015 or something on Cadenze. Um, it's an old MOOC, but those algorithms haven't changed. The ecosystem of tools hasn't changed dramatically. So that's still relevant. Um, my colleagues and I have a, a, a few MOOCs on FutureLearn, which are uh, mainly around, um, well, I guess it's, it's a broader look at creative machine learning and you don't have to be a coder at all to, to start taking them. Um, and, you know, again, I, I think getting some practice in coding is always, I, I think it's always good for anybody, even if you don't end up using code or if you don't end up using machine learning, it gets you thinking differently about digital practices. Um, and that's, you know, can only be a good thing if you don't, you know, throw your computer out the window the first day. All right. Well, I guess like we're, we're at the hour. Oh, it's fun. Thank you. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca.